Today, I will be reading to you the fascinating history of African-American heritage in Vernon County. You will see photographs of these local historical figures, their families, lands, projects, and contributions, and also hear some of our state's history of African-American residents. Before beginning, I would like to comment that this video is co-produced by McIntosh Memorial Library in Viroqua as an acknowledgement of February Black History and African-American Heritage Month which is a part of their all ages year long humanities program entitled Creating Community Beyond Biases, Library Resources. They hope that you continue to join them in presentations throughout 2021. This photographic essay video is brought to you in partnership by the Vernon County Historical Society, Vernon Communications Cooperative, Macintosh Library, and myself. In addition, information provided by the Wisconsin Historical Society and members of the Shivers family. And additionally, funding for this video is provided by the Zubin Beanstack Company, who awarded the library a grant entitled Black Voices Matter in their pursuit to advance local social justice and racial equity through educational programs like this. Historical Wisconsin documents indicate that African Americans have been living and working in Wisconsin since the 18th century. The accountings for this population show continued growth throughout the 19th century. Primarily after the Second World War, African Americans secured numerous job opportunities, living, working, and contributing in the southeastern part of this state. In 1840, before Wisconsin was admitted as a 30th state into the Union, there were fewer than 200 recorded African American people living in the territory. By 1860, pre Civil War, that number was almost 1,200. In 1861, when the Civil War was declared, African Americans were not permitted to serve as soldiers. However, some people joined regiments as non combatants. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation made it possible for black soldiers to enlist in Union regiments. Wisconsin black men residing in cities such as Milwaukee and Janesville and men from rural communities such as Vernon and Grant counties enlisted as soldiers in the Union Army. Over the next two years, 272 Wisconsin men of color joined the Union Army. Another 81 patriotic men from Illinois and Missouri enlisted in substitution for white men draftees that did not or could not serve and received an incentive payment for enlisting. These soldiers were credited to the Wisconsin rolls, bringing the total number of Wisconsin black troops to 353 soldiers. Most of Wisconsin's black soldiers served in Company F of the 29th Infantry Regiment of the United States Colored Troops, which was officially formed in 1864. However, many more African-American men served in other Union Army military units across Wisconsin and the Northern States. On July 22, 1864, 85 black soldiers of Wisconsin's Company F of the 29th arrived in Petersburg, Virginia, and were immediately engaged in the Battle of the Crater. 11 of the 85 soldiers lost their lives in the first week of deployment. Vernon County is connected to the Company F of the 29th by the military service of the Revels family, a historical interracial family that lived in the Cheyenne Valley, town of Forest. For reference of its location, Cheyenne Valley is west of the city of Hillsboro in eastern Vernon County. Mercasia and Morning Revels, early pioneers of Cheyenne Valley, had many family members who served in the military. They had at least three descendants who served in the Company F of the 29th. The son-in-law, Alfred Weaver, the grandson, Aaron Roberts, and the grandson-in-law, Charles Allen. However, interestingly, Macasia and Morning Rebels' sons named Henry and William served in the Company K of the 6th Wisconsin Infantry. Company K of the 6th is not a union of the U.S. colored troops. You see, Macasia and Morning Rebels were a multiracial family, and apparently the U.S. military did not consider their sons colored. Yet their son-in-law, grandson, and grandson-in-law were racially segregated to serve in the Company F of the 29th Unit, 
of the U.S. colored troops. To explain and understand this historical accounting of segregated military units based on race is complicated because it is based upon the shifting and subjective definitions of race at that time. In the Memoirs of Vernon County, published in 1907, an article entitled The Chapter of Forest Township ends with the following quote. The town of Forest has a settlement of colored people, including the Rebels family, who have always been recognized as good citizens. They were faithful soldiers, each of them receiving wounds in battle, end quote. Henry and William Rebels were both wounded in Civil War battle in South Mountain, Maryland on September 14, 1862. William was wounded again at Gettysburg in 1863 and killed in action at Weldon Railroad Station, Virginia in 1864. Henry also received a second injury in 1865, but survived the war. To note, Macasia and Morning Rebels had three other sons that served as Union soldiers in other military units. This local family's service and sacrifice and patriotic citizens was grand. Chapter two, Cheyenne Valley, Forest Township, Vernon County. Despite the unrest of the Civil War, two communities predominantly comprised of black American families settled and thrived far from urban centers in rural Southwest Wisconsin. The larger of these was the multiracial farming settlement of Cheyenne Valley in the town of Forest in Eastern Vernon County. In the mid 1850s, predating the Civil War, several families of free black Americans settled in this valley as pioneers and farmers to develop their home settlement. The earliest black families in the valley were all free people, not escaped slaves. Walden Stewart, formerly of North Carolina, became at age 60 one of the first permanent settlers. And Wesley Barton, early settler, founded the village of Barton's Corners, where his sons served as the first black postmasters in the Midwest, managing the operations at the town of Barton's Corners post office. They lived alongside Norwegian, Irish, and Bohemian immigrants from Europe and indigenous Africans. Residents often shared tools and labor and even intermarried. Such was the case for Macasia and Morning Revels family, early pioneers and settlers of Cheyenne Valley. Originally, the valley was known as Revels Valley, only later in the 1940s and 50s became referred to as Cheyenne Valley. The second community was in Grant County, Wisconsin, where 35 black people freed from the bondage of slavery were accounted for in the 1860 census. The first African-American settlers arrived there in 1848. Most of these people lived in the community of Pleasant Ridge in the town of B-Town in Grant County. Black and indigenous people of color from Cheyenne Valley and Pleasant Ridge enlisted to fight in the Civil War. And both communities also welcomed former slaves from the South into their communities after the war had ended. Although a historical Cheyenne Valley figure, Wesley Barton is said to have brought a slave boy with him, having, quote, stolen him from his owner, unquote. Cheyenne Valley flourished as the families grew and expanded from generation to generation. And like all small communities that thrived, family members began to travel outside of Vernon County for school and marriage. Today, not many of the original families still reside in Cheyenne Valley. However, the descendants of the original families host large family reunions and have a nonprofit organization known as Cheyenne Settlers Heritage Society. Chapter three, Samuel Arms. Former slave, drummer boy, and resident of Cheyenne, Samuel Arms began his life as a slave in Virginia, became a drummer for the Union Army during the Civil War, eventually relocated to settle in Cheyenne Valley as a pioneer and farmer. According to his tombstone, Samuel Arms was born on Christmas day in 1851. He was of course treated very cruelly as a slave and escaped from his Georgia plantation at least once. However, Samuel gained his during the Civil War when a Union regiment adopted him as a drummer boy. It's believed that he traveled with the Union soldiers to Pennsylvania after the war. Sometime later, he moved west to Wisconsin, eventually settling in Forest Township where he became a part of the multiracial community of Cheyenne Valley. Samuel worked there as a horse trainer and farmer. He married Mary Ellen Roberts in the late 1870s. 
Mary had been born in Forest Township in the early 1860s, the daughter of Ishmael Delaney Rebels Roberts, making Mary a family member, a descendant of Macasia and Morning Rebels. Mary and Samuel had 17 children during their years together. Their youngest son was named Otis Arms. Samuel Arms was proud of his service in the Union Army. He marched with his Civil War drum and veterans parades every year. Until recently, his descendants owned the drum, and you can see a photo of it in the book, Freedom Train North by Julia Furderhurt. The book is available for research use at the Vernon County Historical Society, and you can find it at public libraries throughout Vernon County. Samuel died on November 16, 1917, and was buried in the Forest Bird Cemetery in Forest Township, Vernon County. He lived through momentous times, experiencing his and his family's enslavement in Georgia, then as a child soldier in the Civil War, then after abolition of slavery, moved to Wisconsin to become a farmer, husband, and father of 17 children. He created a life of freedom for himself and his family here in Vernon County. Chapter four, Jefferson Craft, former slave of 60 years, resident of Cheyenne Valley and the city of Viroqua. An 1870 census of the township of Forest provides details about Jefferson Craft, a resident of Cheyenne Valley. It describes Jefferson Craft as a black male, age 68, a farmer born in Tennessee. He was living with Celia Craft, age 61, Lottie Godfrey, age 18, and Lottie's three-year-old daughter, all described as black. Three years after this census was taken on March 27, 1873, Jefferson Kraft and Lottie Godfrey were married in the city of Iroquois by the Vernon County judge, a 40-year difference in their ages. Why they traveled from Cheyenne Valley to Viroqua to be married is unknown. Records indicate they lived in the valley on 40 acres, which they owned throughout the 1870s and 1880s. The journey by foot on the horse on dirt road to Viroqua would have been considerably long and difficult. But had they been married in Cheyenne Valley, it is much less likely that a marriage record would have been filed. So it is assumed that the formality of their marriage was highly valued by the couple. In 1880, Jefferson and his wife Lottie had four children, Florence, age 13, Aranta, age eight, Benjamin, age five, and Mary, age three. Their fourth daughter, Delia, wouldn't be born for another five years. The second oldest daughter, Arantha, was said to be attending school, possibly the nearby Eastman School, which was founded in 1887. Their oldest child, Florence, had attended school earlier in the year and then probably graduated by the age of 13, which was the age that most children finished their schooling in those times. Their only son, Benjamin, and third daughter, Mary, would have been too young to have been attending school the year the census was taken. The 1880 census also tells us that Lottie and her parents were born in Kentucky, while Jefferson and his father were from Tennessee. Jefferson's mother was born in Africa, and this is the clearest recorded indication that he and his mother were once slaves. His mother was probably brought to this country as a slave on a slave ship sometime before January of 1808, when the African slave trade was officially abolished in the U.S. According to additional census records, Jefferson and Lottie could not read or write. In some manner, Jefferson and Lottie were informed about the Cheyenne Valley settlement. Their neighbors in the valley, Ed Harris and Thomas Shizvers, were also former slaves from Tennessee. Perhaps there was a connection between Lottie and her family or Jefferson and his family with these people prior to moving to Wisconsin. The Jefferson and Lottie Craft families appears on the 1885 census records as still living in the town of Forest. And some time after that, they moved to the city of Viroqua. No reason has been recorded for the family's move. Their previous home of Cheyenne Valley was one of the largest rural African-American communities in Wisconsin at the time, and Viroqua was not. Perhaps Jefferson Kraft had retired from full-time farming but still needed an income to support his family. Sources differ on Jefferson's age, but he was probably at least in his 70s by the time of the move. 
In Viroqua, Jefferson worked at Frank Mitchell's Dray Barn with the horses, which operated from 1879 to 1900, and on Mitchell's farm across from the Vernon County Fairgrounds. Jefferson also worked as the city's lamplighter. Gas lamps were installed on Viroqua's major thoroughfares in 1887, electricity arriving a few years later in 1892. Jefferson's only son, Benjamin, joined alongside his father at his jobs, tending the horses by day and lighting the city's gas street lamps in the evening. Sadly, in the early 1890s, several members of the Kraft family died. Their deaths announced in Viroqua's newspaper, the Vernon County Censor. The youngest daughter, Delia, only five years old, died in 1890. Lottie, wife, and mother died in 1891, and then Father Jefferson passed in 1894. Jefferson Kraft's obituary described him as, quote, something remarkably original in character, a Southern slave for 60 years or more. He and his family were more than once sold on the oxen block of human slavery to the rebellion when he escaped from bondage and came north with returning soldiers, unquote. His funeral was conducted at the Kraft family's home in Viroqua by the Reverend George Washburn Newsom, retired Methodist minister. Jefferson Kraft lived more than half of his life as a slave in Tennessee and by some destined news was informed of a safe interracial community in the hills and valleys of Forest Township in Southwest Wisconsin. Jefferson Kraft built a life of freedom in his last years for himself and his young family in Cheyenne Valley and Viroqua, Wisconsin. Chapter 5. Algy Shivers, resident of Cheyenne Valley, World War I veteran, tremendous builder, and family man. Vernon County is well known for its round barns, and Algy Shivers of Cheyenne Valley is well known for building about 15 of them. It's historically known that Algie's father, Thomas Shivers, was born a slave, migrated to Vernon County in 1879, acquired over 250 acres to farm in the Cheyenne Valley, making him one of the largest landowners of African heritage in Wisconsin at the time. According to historian Kevin Alderson in his book, Barns Without Corners, quote, Thomas Shivers was deeply interested in anything that promoted rural progress. Being a pioneer farmer, he started farming with oxen, but over his lifetime, he had his first farm tractor in the area in 1917, installed a hot and cold water system in his home in 1919, and in the 1920s added an electric lighting and power system. He was very progressive and quite prosperous, unquote. Thomas had six children whom he raised mostly as a single father. Algy was born April 7, 1889 in Cheyenne Valley, and he grew up on the Shivers farm. He went to primary school in Dilly, Wisconsin, and alongside his brothers played on the Mount Tabor baseball team. Once grown, he moved to Sedalia, Missouri, where he attended the George R. Smith College. Ever the athlete, he played second base on the college's baseball team. It's believed that he trained as a carpenter while living and studying in Missouri. Algie was called to serve in World War I. The U.S. military was segregated at the time. Algie became a private in the 365th Infantry Regiment, which was a unit of the 92nd Division. He was sent to Camp Grant in Rockford, Illinois to train. He went with the 92nd Division to France in June of 1918. Shivers' family stories relate that Algie served as a driver in France, driving officers around in a motorcycle sidecar. In his military experience, he traveled France on motorcycle and learned to speak French. World War II ended in 1918 and the 92nd Division returned to the USA in 1919. Upon return, he, his brothers and neighbors worked as a crew constructing 15 round barns in northeastern Vernon County, including one on their family farm. According to Alderson's book, Algy and his crew cut the necessary logs from the farmer's wood one or two years prior to constructing the barns. After the wood cured, he and a two or three man crew sawed the logs into boards. Actual construction took about three months. The barn raisings were a big to do. Algy recorded these events in his notebook, highlighting the large meals and great food that was served. 
RJ himself was a prosperous farmer. He owned over 300 acres, raised crops of oats, wheat, corn, barley, and potatoes. He kept hogs, chickens, cows, horses, and sheep. In 1945, on a Sunday afternoon near Wildcat Mountain State Park, Algie married Flora Revels Waldron, the granddaughter of Macasia and Morning Revels. At that time, Flora was 65 years old and a widow. Algie was 58. Although they never had any children of their own, they helped raise three children of a young mother whose husband had died of cancer. And Algie and Flora raised the children of these children once they had grown. Flora, called Flory, was naturally maternal caregiver to these children. She also raised a large garden every year. Shivers family members tell stories of how Algie and Flora encouraged them to pursue their educations. Algie himself was an educated man and an avid reader throughout his life. Algie died in November of 1978. He and his wife Flora were buried in the Forest Bird Cemetery. Algie, Flora, and their adopted and extended family had been together often. It would be for church services, holidays, birthday parties, or building the historical round barns of Vernon County. They thrived as members of a unique integrated rural community. Chapter six, Cheyenne Valley, the Mississippi River, Liberty Pole, and the Underground Railroad. Tales are told about local locations that might have been safe locations for the Underground Railroad in Vernon County. Those being Cheyenne Valley, the Mississippi River, and the village of Liberty Pole in Franklin Township. However, the Vernon County Historical Society does not yet have any evidence that the people of these locations harbored, hid, or assisted people of color who were escaping for their lives from southern slave-owning states as part of the Underground Railroad. To be most historically accurate, the state of Wisconsin was not often used by the Underground Railroad. The most prominent instances mostly occurred in the southeastern corner of the state, where men, women, and children that were fleeing from their captors and slave-driven plantations could board or stow away on ships and sail across the Great Lakes to be granted their freedom in Canada. To note, the upper Mississippi River was a minor route of the Underground Railroad. Therefore, people could escape slavery if they went up the Mississippi by way of boat to St. Paul, Minnesota, and further into Canada. In view of that, the western edge of Vernon County, the Mississippi River itself, can be considered part of one minor underground railroad route. However, most of the escaped slaves who came up the Mississippi River branched off to the Rock River in Illinois, south of Vernon County, and ended up near Beloit, Wisconsin. From there, people made their way east to Lake Michigan to board ships to Canada. As mentioned, there are tales about the village of Liberty Pole in Franklin Township of Vernon County being connected to the Underground Railroad as well. This village was known as Bad Axe in the 1850s. Bad Axe was the site of a large abolitionist political rally in 1865 pre-Civil War. At this rally, there was an impressive ceremonial raising of a pro-abolitionist campaign flag. That wooden flagpole, also known as the Liberty Pole, continued to stand for several years until it succumbed to the elements. This liberty pole was a symbol of anti-slavery and black freedom. However, it has not yet been verified that it was a sign to run away slave peoples that this place was on the Underground Railroad. Chapter 7, The Era of Reconstruction and the Great Migration in Wisconsin. As the years of the Civil War raged on and people were fleeing on the Underground Railroad and Northern Yankee troops swept through Southern slaveholding states, Black Americans were also migrating north to Wisconsin's towns and cities. Despite strong statewide support for the Union cause of the Civil War, most Wisconsin residents were not sympathetic to the plight of African Americans. In Wisconsin, as elsewhere in the nation, the decades following the Civil War were a time of struggle for Black Americans during the short period of the Reconstruction era. At about the turn of the century, only 45 Black Civil War veterans were still living in Wisconsin. In 1910, fewer than 3,000 African Americans were recorded as living in Wisconsin. 
The majority of these people lived in southeastern cities and they faced very limited employment opportunities since most factories were segregated. Job opportunities during World War I, 1914 to 1918, held promise for some people of color in the Milwaukee area. But by 1930, the African-American population of individuals and family had only increased by 7,000 people. Unlike neighboring states, Wisconsin did not experience a sizable migration from the South, primarily because of limiting employment factors, such as segregated urban factory employment. The supply of labor had already been satisfied by early white ethnic immigrants from Europe. Additionally, most small Wisconsin family farms were owner-operated and had relatively little demand for hired labor. Furthermore, widespread white prejudice and segregation in housing and employment also made Wisconsin an unattractive destination. When the Depression hit in 1929, African Americans in Wisconsin suffered in large numbers. As late as March 1940, 45% of Wisconsin's black population was unemployed compared to 13% of whites. While World War II's critical wartime industries temporarily provided employment, housing, segregation, and other forms of discrimination continued during the years of 1939 to 1945. Historically, a large-scale migration of African-American citizens to Wisconsin mostly occurred in the decades following World War II. Between 1940 and 1960, Wisconsin's African-American population of individuals and families increased by nearly 600 percent, from 12,159 people in 1940 to 74,546 people in 1960. The increase occurred in part from the potential of employment in cities during the war, where many people settled in to stay and raise their families. The censuses showed that these new residents had relocated predominantly from Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee, and other states, of course. <laughs>